Great. Thanks very much again, as I said. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. It's good to see some of you for, uh, it's been a, been a while, but it's great to be back. I'm going to give you, as Graham said, the talk today our, on our workshop is the current state of Alberta's connectivity, looking at the infrastructure solutions that we have available to bring broadband into our communities or enhance it, and a bit on technological developments. And this is all going to be big brush strokes here. This is an overview, and uh, some of it may seem a little simplified, but we have a little bit to get through. And put my phone on silent. Jeez. Conferences, forgot. And, and basically sort of step through that. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is going to, we're going to use that, that 50 megabit, 10 megabit uh, as our threshold as we talk about things. And I know there was a bit of debate yesterday. Is that really sufficient for a, for a single household or not? Let's not worry about that too much right now. Let's just say that if we have less than that, we're probably hurting a little bit. And, and we're using that as our minimum threshold, as is the government. So we'll move on from there. So today, basically, uh, just a quick overview, we'll look at the current state of broadband in Alberta. A few of us have given a bit of an overview. Dr. McNally yesterday took a couple of my slides away from me, but uh, uh, no, that was all good. We'll, we'll, we'll go through that, and then we'll look at some of the solutions. You'll note that uh, when we talk about the solutions that what we don't have in the mix there is, uh, is mobile wireless. And there's a reason for that. Mobile wireless, as uh, James Van Lewin had said yesterday too, is almost an app on top of a network in, in some respects. And it certainly can be a, a solution provider of some sort, but uh, fits into possibly a slightly different category. So, And then we'll, we'll look at future opportunities, just briefly what's going on in the province today and, and, and how can we help move ourselves forward into better, better broadband. Now, <clears throat> you saw this data yesterday a little bit from uh, Dr. McNally's presentation, but I've uh, broken it down just for Alberta. This is all Alberta households right now, urban and rural. This isn't just looking at the rural side of things. And if you, you take a look at it, it looks like most Albertans have at least some internet. 99.7% uh, have at least a five megabit internet service. And, and then it, it goes down a little bit there. And, and the target level that I've highlighted there is the 5010 and unlimited data transfer. And that's the important part. That is actually how the CRTC and uh, innovation science and economic development uh, identify the service level. And unlimited data transfer means that the networks being utilized are robust enough to be able to have all of us as power users. And of course, now that we have Disney Plus, all of us are power users, right? So we're, we're, we're looking at that sort of a scenario. So that, that's kind of the benchmark and something you have to look at when you're looking at network capability. Uh, it gets a little bit um, further on down from there, 100 megabit or better. It's a decent throughput, a uh, decent number of the pop of the households have it, but certainly it's going to be a lot worse when we look at rural. And Giggy, it shows 33% of Alberta households have that. And that's probably better now because that's really 2019 data. It was the 2020 connectivity report from the CRTC that this comes out of, and they're using 2019 data. I know that TELUS came through my own neighborhood in North Edmonton uh, just last year to, to throw fiber to the home services in. But what are we talking about? We're talking about rural Alberta. And uh, Dr. McNally had these stats as well yesterday. But when you, when you take a look at it, access to the 5010 threshold is uh, remarkably lower, not very good at all. And certainly on First Nations reserves, it gets even worse. So. There's a lot of work to be done, and, and I guess that's probably why we're here today. So let's uh, move ourselves a little bit forward. Uh, if you want to take a look at this information, this is where it's going to get a little bit more controversial, but let's take a look at it in a picture. Uh, this picture, uh, again, the same as yesterday, but I use different colors, so it looks like a different slide. That's essentially what we're looking at here are the population centers. So you have our major urban areas having 75 to 100% of the households have access to 50, 10 or better. And then it moves on down from there. And this image is taken from that map that we were talking about yesterday, that very controversial map. 
it's the the CRTC and and I said got together and and they tried to come up and, and I, you have to give them credit they tried to come up with a very good product that could give us a very granular look at Canada and at the amount of internet services that are provided in any given part of Canada and the information where did it come from well as we noted a lot of it came from internet service providers particularly the large carriers and that data well maybe maybe it was accurate but based on their their information that the, the types of services they're trying to provide to canadians it may be slightly suspect but it's not the only source of information the crtc also conducts annual surveys of canadians and the type of service levels they're getting and how adequate they are and finally the crtc does do some of its own independent testing they have a third party that comes in and they connect up testing equipment to a number of households across Canada. The unfortunate part is they only connect it up to major provider services. So that definitely limits the data. So they've, they've done their best to come up with a very good quality service that shows us how internet is distributed across Canada and to a very granular level because if you burrow down on this information, you can definitely try to, uh, you, you move down from this image of, of these, uh, uh, of Canada in general, and you go into something they call their rural road coverage. So if you, you take a look over on the left where the legend is, once you've zoomed in enough on the map, it, it switches over to this view. And the idea is, is that most people live along a roadway of some sort or other. So if they identify what type of coverage the roads have, then we have an idea as to, to what's actually happening and, uh, and, and can see what communities actually have what type of service. Now, this may look slightly familiar to you and I'll explain it a little bit more. This is Sturgeon County that our friend Rob Schneider talked about yesterday. If you look down in the grayed out area, that's the city of St. Albert and, and the upper part of Edmonton there. And, and I live in that area, but never mind. And we'll move on. But basically what's going on is in Sturgeon County, Rob talked about the fact that they sort of misrepresented it. They, they, if you look at it here and you look over at our legend, the roads are all green. That means all of the area along that there are getting 50, 10 or better already. So Rob, why is your county even bothering to put a service on or to put out an RFP or an RFI? You're already covered, it's all good. And that's what the government thinks, the federal government. And that's why federal grant funding would not be allocated to Sturgeon County. And there's a few areas that are slightly lighter colored that are in some of these, uh, these, I don't know if you can see them or not, but the roads, the problem is it's not accurate. There's another organization that I think a number of you know called CIRA in Canada, the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. And they basically manage the .ca domain, anything .ca is going through them at the highest levels. And they have a number of other services that they also offer, um, cybersecurity and certain other uh, domain name service things that they do, as well as they have an internet performance test. And that internet performance test is something that's available for everybody. And I should probably, I'll put it up on the chat here in a minute. Uh, you can get to, it's pretty straightforward. I think it's uh, performance.internet.ca or sierra.ca. I'll put it up there. And the idea is, is that that performance test is captured information and any device that you own, any service that you own uh, any in any household, Will, that will capture what your actual throughput is at any point in time. And we're going to look at the same community using exactly the same legend uh, through the eyes of CIRA and see what kind of performance is actually happening in Sturgeon County. Now, I, we apologize, they didn't put the roadways in there, but it's exactly the same area. Down in the bottom is St. Albert, and there's Edmonton, and there's Morinville up there. And you can see that there are a few places where there are some nice green dots like the other map had indicated and down in the population centers, there's uh, definitely some green dots there as well. But there's a whole lot of dark blue, light blue and, uh, and some definitely a lot of purple. And purple is, is horrible throughput, it's less than 5.1 megabits per second. 
I know some of you in remote parts of Alberta are saying, well, we got nothing, but this is not a good representation. This is a problem for the federal government because certainly the universal broadband fund is being designed, for example, to, to help everybody. And there's definitely a lot of underserved Canadians that are not going to have the ability to have federal grant funding assisting them in being able to resolve this. Now, Sturgeon County is going ahead regardless because you have to. Your strategies can't wait for government strategies to um, get your solutions in place and so on. But this is definitely where we're at right now. We have uh, good service in urban areas. We have poor servant service in rural areas. And I call these sort of shoulder communities uh, areas that also are still having real issues at this point in time. So current state, that's where we're at. And uh, it's just an example of, of things aren't always as good as they may seem. So let's look at the infrastructure. What kinds of solutions are being used today and, and can be used? And as I mentioned, I, uh, mobile wireless is eliminated here. It will be in that report that's coming out, by the way, but we talk about mobile wireless, but we won't talk about it too much today. And again, this is very simplistic, big brushstrokes, as I said, as to the pros and cons on these types of solutions. Um, and a lot of you already know this, but if you look at fiber, the pros are capacity and distance. Fiber is the future-proof technology. It has the ability to go into vast amounts of increased bandwidth uh, solutions. Individual wavelengths are being tested at one terabit throughputs right now over a fiber optic cable. We have transceiver type electronics now so that you can both send and receive on a single fiber um, rather than a pairs of fibers. And then when you look at the types of fiber cables that are being put out there by ISPs today, you have minimally the, the smallest bundles will technically 12 or 24 fiber fibers are in a, in a bundle, but realistically it's 144 bundles going down highways and, uh, and, and perhaps even larger ones than that. So lots of fiber capacity. And of course you can put individual different colors, basically different wavelengths of light can go down the same fiber at the same time, each one of them delivering 10 gig, 100 gig, you know, or, or more at this point in time. So capacity wise fiber is just a great option and distance as well. You can, I believe, go uh, up to 100 kilometers or more without having to repeat uh, the signal. So it has uh, distance and, and other things all in its favor. And of course, the cons to fiber is the fact that it's a difficult thing to deploy. Uh, a lot of times you're trying to put it in the ground so that you can avoid other issues, uh, such as weather and such being able to get to the cables or the fibers. But uh, trenching is not easy. Well, it's easy to do in a lot of a lot of Alberta, actually. A lot of us have very nice soil that we can trench through, and it works really well. A little harder if you're in Banff, uh, where you got granite two inches below the soil, that becomes problematic. You can put it on overhead uh, telephone poles, but they're vast. They're they're starting to disappear, other than our more rural areas, and they're always uh, there's still costs involved with that as well. So that's fiber optics, fixed wireless. Fixed wireless, the pro here is deployment. You, you throw a tower up and then you have the ability to uh, beam out your services directly. You don't have to worry about trenching, directional drilling or anything else. I put a question mark behind the cost though. And uh, the reason for that is, is that uh, while it's cheaper for sure than, than using fiber optics, I remember was it yesterday, somebody said going four blocks cost $80,000 to move fiber optics. Very expensive. Putting a tower up and direct line of sight to people is uh, an easier solution. But if you're a small local ISP trying to deliver services and you have to put a tower up, if you're not lucky like Viking to have a, a green tower that you could just use, uh, then that tower alone could cost you fifty, sixty thousand dollars to 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 put up and install. And maybe maybe you're reaching seventy or eighty customers. And every one of those customers wants service for uh, under 100 bucks a month and the whole bit. And it could take a while for your return on investment to come through. So cost, definitely cheaper than fiber. But on a, uh, a business point of view, it's not necessarily cheap. 
capacity of distance become issues here, and uh, we're aware of this. I think Viking said they could go 15 kilometers from their from their uh, tower, so they have some good ability there, but definitely less than fiber optic at this point in time. So the distance is less capacity-wise. There are giggy uh, radio services out there, and you can put multiple radios uh, beside maybe on different uh, frequencies and achieve sort of a multi-gig capability. Getting beyond that uh, might start to uh, strain. I know with 5G, we're getting into 5G world now, both in uh, mobile wireless as well as fixed wireless solutions are going that way. 5G is going to be able to get us to 10 gig or better, but the problem is going to be distance again, because now you might be going from a dozen kilometers down to a kilometer or even several hundred meters in some cases when you get to the higher throughput. So there are going to be some concerns around uh, distance with, with fixed wireless. Last and not least is satellite. And satellite deployment is uh, something where when it was just geostationary, we have a pretty good idea of what its pros and what its cons are and whether or not weather or other things could be a, an issue with that. But now we have low Earth orbit satellites. And I think that the real pros and cons around that are still to be determined as we're just deploying now. I know that uh, there was a, a test done out, somebody I know that has an, an early version of, of, of Starlink services or that, uh, that I've heard through the grapevine about have said that uh, it's very good capacity, very good throughput, working very well. But we'll talk about it a little bit further on. But there were some initial deployment issues. So our solution using fiber, where can we get all of this fiber from? So obviously our internet service providers are telcos and others, uh, whether local or, or national. The SuperNet, which is really just another internet service provider, but it's a, a little bit unique, and we'll talk about that. And then we have custom solutions. Uh, that with, this is the do-it-yourself projects, and we have regional municipal projects underway, and we'll look at those solutions. And I said other providers. I really meant other sources of fiber optic cabling, which are out there, and they're becoming less of a, of a viable option these days, but we'll, we'll take a look at those as well. So first of all, let's take a look at what's happening out there with our telcos. TELUS is distributing fiber to the home. They first announced uh, Edmonton was going to be done, the first city in Canada back in 2015. And uh, it's, it's, it's a major, major project to put fiber uh, to the home in, um, in a large urban city. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of issues that you have to deal with when you're putting fiber to, to the home in uh, Edmonton, Calgary, Toronto, or places like that, because you don't have control of the infrastructure yourself directly. It's your fiber, but you're putting it through city rights of ways and utilities, and it's the cities who are controlling when you get to do construction, how you get to do construction, if you can trench through a road, if you have to directional drill, if you have to do other things. Very expensive, actually. And that's why four blocks in a major city can cost you five times as much as putting it two or putting it eight blocks in a in a small community. Uh, it's a lot easier to get approval for projects in smaller towns and, and uh, communities than it is to in major cities. So the complexity is a lot less. But they started in Edmonton with their pure fiber services. As I said, they reached my place in 2020. So they took five years for deployment, and. Uh, then they've gone to small communities as well, and uh, I'm not sure what reasoning they're using for which communities they're going to in Alberta at this point in time. Uh, everybody would say, well, where it's the easiest and cheapest so that they can make the most money, and certainly that would be the case. But they have reached 25 communities or municipalities. 19 of those are populations under 10,000. So um, you have the, the Hintons or the um, Vulcans or some of the other places in, that are smaller communities, uh, Vagerville, that are, are getting fiber to the home solutions right now from TELUS. There was another company, I don't know if, uh, how many of you were aware of it, but when Axia um, Supernet Limited was around, uh, Axia Net Media, their, their mother corp, also had another company that was a competing ISP in the province called Axia Connect. And they specifically were delivering fiber to the home to rural communities. And when Bell bought out Axia as part of the 2018 contract for SuperNet, 
they uh, they don't deliver residential internet services in Western Canada, so they wanted to offload the Axia Connect service, and uh, Telus ended up buying it in 2019. But it's been taking some time to do and um, prepare for a transition of the network into Telus's network. Uh, that probably is going to happen starting this year and and into 2022. But that'll add 14 more communities to Telus's current 25. And then, of course, we've just heard that Telus has won some universal broadband fund uh, projects to what's it, I think up to 43 more communities and I'm, I'm not sure what tech they're actually using to deploy services there we haven't seen a lot of the details yet on, on these things that have come out so their numbers may be increasing and getting out to um, large but smaller communities in the rural areas of, of Alberta. I put Sean here or Rogers or whatever they're going to be called in a while uh, and, the, and it's really they're using cable as sort of the last few hundred meters or whatever of their delivery, but they are able to achieve gig download speeds and their whole backhaul is fiber these days. So I, I have included them as a solution provider, but it's highly unlikely that they would go, say, to a new town or put in solutions in a town where they're not already um, in place. So they may or may not be a, a good option for somebody that's looking for fiber to the home type solutions or, or gig type solutions for services. The exciting news to me are that other ISPs, smaller ones, are actually getting into this game as well. And uh, I was uh, talking with ExploreNet and uh, a little bit with MCSNet. ExploreNet, of course, is a national internet service provider that has delivered almost exclusively fixed wireless and satellite services to communities across Canada. They don't compete in the urban space at all. But last year, they started to put in fiber to the home solutions in Ontario. And it's looking like Alberta is going to be part of their um, future growth in that type of service as well. So we could start to see some of that happen. Uh, MCSNet is a pure Alberta provider, and uh, they're mostly, I believe, in central, central east Alberta. I know they've used uh, Supernet as a backhaul network before as well. So that's why I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with them. And uh, they look like they've introduced on their website that they're delivering fiber to the home options in some cases as well. So some of our smaller communities that maybe don't want to get into the game themselves as a, uh, in a partnership program or whatever could consider talking to some of these uh, service providers as well. And there, there may be some solutions there that uh, could work for them. Next, this is SuperNet. Supernet is the sort of unique service provider. So way back in 1998, there was something called the Alberta Science and Research Authority, and they made a recommendation to the then Ralph Klein government that if we're going to go into this next millennium, we better be having uh, better speed solutions. And even back then, we knew that telcos and other providers were less likely to be bringing high cost solutions like fiber into their communities uh, if they had to do it themselves because the theoretical return on investment wouldn't be that good. Uh, this was before, of course, uh, mobile wireless became a solution and started to see fiber being thrown out into the communities a bit more. However, it was a good solution at the time, and the concept was let's connect every public sector building in the province directly to fiber and see what we end up with and see if we can then use the backhaul across the province to stimulate the growth of regional internet service providers to provide services in the more far-flung parts of our province. And if you look at the map, it's got uh, some green and blue there, and it very much distributed fiber throughout the province in a way that no other province really has seen, uh, even to this day in some cases, they're very much more corridor-based solutions in Ontario, British Columbia, or just about anywhere else. And uh, the, the colors don't mean as much anymore because it's, it's now all colored bell. It says uh, before it was uh, green for the base area network and uh, blue for the extended area network, but it's essentially all one service these days. And it does go to a lot of places. It goes through to most of the First Nations, uh, as we learned yesterday. You know, most of the schools were connected up to SuperNet back at the time, and through our Métis settlements as well. 
And the network, well, we could talk a lot about it. I, to me personally, there was a lot of success with SuperNet. People say, well, it failed. It didn't quite meet the need. But in, a, in actual fact, at the public sector side, our rural health and uh, our education networks did had some great success using SuperNet and continue to this day to a large part. At the same point in time, did it stimulate enough to all of these small communities? Well, we over 200 communities lit up with some type of internet service as a result of super, or direct or indirectly as a result of SuperNet, but they didn't get to everywhere. So it may or may not have worked, but we learned from the mistakes and I helped to put together the uh, technical specs for the RFP, but also we, we put together a, a contract to be signed as part of the RFP for when we, we tendered or the government tendered the uh, retendered the contract for SuperNet. And that was one, as you probably know, by Bell in 2018. And starting on July 1, that contract kicked in and there was a section of that contract, section 13, which we can make fun of, but section 13 of the contract provides for SuperNet to be used to support rural and remote Alberta. So it's more, it's more directly mentioned in this contract, whereas it was sort of less directly mentioned in the previous contract. Municipal and regional governments um, have additional access because they are public sector entities and as such can get access that private or for-profit organizations cannot. Everybody gets to use SuperNet, but what a municipality could do, for example, let's go back to that $80,000 to go for blocks for fiber sort of scenario that we talked about yesterday. Normally you can't get uh, a connection into a um, telecommunications provider's network unless it's at their central office or their point of presence or meet me location. Instead, uh, you, you have to go there. But in this particular case, if you are a regional government or something, then you would be allowed to have access to uh, what are called handholds, for example, within a community. So if there was a school or a hospital with SuperNet nearby, you might only have to extend your fiber to where their fiber is and you can splice into a, an unused pair of fibers there and get your connection running. And that's something that's generally taboo from a telco point of view, but it's incorporated into the contract for this time around. And I'm, I'm not sure, but I, the, the town, I know that uh, both the Viking and Vermilion solutions that we heard about yesterday, uh, I believe are using SuperNet as their backhaul and, and they may have taken advantage of something like that that could help reduce your implementation costs. And as I said, all other ISPs, typically the, the local or uh, local ISPs or some of the regional ISPs are able to access SuperNet at wholesale rates via Bell. That is SuperNet and I'll certainly take questions later. Oh, I should make a caveat here a comment. I was a part of the SuperNet project from the conceptual stage through the RFP and uh, the implementation of it all the way through, as I said, providing technical specifications and helping re redo the contract part for the new contract with Bell. However, nevertheless, I have to point out that I am retired from the government of Alberta for very nearly three years, and my words today do not represent the government. Uh, you would need to talk to Holly Salou or one of her bosses to get that type of representation. So there, there's my caveat out of the way. And uh, so we've we've looked at the commercially available solutions and, and government sort of uh, available solutions, and now we can look at uh, the do-it-yourself solutions. If uh, the other options aren't really good for your particular area, then what else can you do? And uh, we've, we've heard a couple of examples of this, particularly Rob talking yesterday about what Sturgeon plans on doing and what some of the other communities have done. So the option of uh, public-private partnerships is definitely there and can be a good solution. A couple of examples, we talked about the town of Olds and what they've done and uh, very, very, I, I followed with uh, the town olds and was part of their presentations way back in the mid 2000s and uh, so on. And they're very brave and they went forward with a really good concept. And as was mentioned yesterday, they originally were looking at what was known as an open access network solution. And that meant that their, their original plan was to simply put the fiber in to all the households and or businesses that they could uh, get signed up in, in olds 
and then ask for third party providers like TELUS or Shaw or somebody to come in and provide the services over their network. And the service providers refused. A lot of us are mad at them for that type of thing. And we, we think that the reasons that they did this was because of a pure profit point of view. But at the time, and, and it is an arguable um, point from these guys, but at the time they would basically be saying, look, if I have to provide service level guarantees or certainly best effort guarantees to my customer base, and I'm not in control of the media, the medium in which that service is being delivered, then there are going to be issues with me being able to provide those service levels. So that was their excuse. Well, it, it didn't work on Supernet. Supernet, they, they, they tried to say the same thing, but I know Shaw went there. They delivered the services, uh, internet services directly over Supernet to many school divisions and helped to, to really bring the price of bandwidth back, uh, back down in, in those days, which was, uh, well, that's another story, but very high. And we were able to bring the, the numbers down a lot and Shaw had no problem using Supernet perhaps because it was large enough, maybe it had a major carrier behind it in the sense of uh, Bell built the infrastructure. Um, not sure what was going on there, but those were the reasons why the carriers didn't want to go into Olds or that was what they told Olds, at least in that case. So Olds had to do it all on their own. So they created their own services called ONET that they um, brought in their backhaul ser services elsewhere and are providing television and phone and, and internet services now. The town of Waterton, I believe, is doing something similar to that. They were able to get fiber all the way down to their little community in the national park there and uh, have delivered uh, uh, different types of services in Waterton as well. So they're doing quite well. Red Deer County, of course, so we haven't actually talked too much about them, but they have a private public partnership right now with a company called Velo Networks. And they're actually starting to deliver some fiber to the home services in one or two of their communities and moving forward. Clearwater County is uh, definitely engaged in uh, up in the Rocky area and then putting together a fiber slash uh, wireless type solutions, so a bit of a hybrid uh, that they're putting in place. Big Lakes County up in uh, Slay Lake. And I know there's probably counties and other areas that I've missed on this. And we heard all about Sturgeon yesterday and the direction that they're going in from Rob Schneider. So there's fiber to the home services, possibly minimally fiber to the node. We've talked about the fact that sometimes it just doesn't make economic sense at this time, at least to put fiber to the home of every uh, household. So fiber to the node means you're going to a tower somewhere and then you're getting a third party provider in the open access network type solution to provide the rest of the, uh, fi the, 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 rest of the last mile connectivity for now. So that's another option that's available. And certainly it's, it definitely takes more effort on the part of the government, but you take a lot of effort for roads and you take a lot of effort for sewage and for water and everything else. And this is yet another utility as we've talked about. So it might be the right direction to go if you're waiting for private companies to come, it might not happen. I talked about other uh, fiber optic infrastructure owners, and uh, the, these are almost non-starters, but they, they did get mentioned uh, in the report, so I'll have to talk to, the, to this a little bit. Uh, if you're another utility, such as electricity or, or uh, pipelines uh, providing options, you have to maintain those, your infrastructure. The electrical transmission towers have fiber optics that run right along the top of those large transmission towers that is called optical ground uh, wire type solutions. And there's a lot of capacity is there, but there are access issues around it. The essence is, is that if you're going to run electricity and you have a power surge on the network, uh, you can blow a transformer and that in turn will cascade to the next one and the next one and the next one. So you have to shut down that network for that electricity very quickly. So you have to have a fast acting network that can get there and do that. Fiber optics will do that for these power companies. The problem is, is that uh, you, you only need one or two fibers for your, for your circuit, but you can't just put a small little thin wire up on the top there because uh, the, the wind storms, ice storms, other things could uh, take it out in a heartbeat. So 
not a good time to be losing your network. So therefore they put thick cables and putting 48 fiber strands through a thick cable is apparently just about the same cost as putting a, a smaller number through. So they all have a lot of capacity running along these transmission towers, which of course, as we know, go through major corridors throughout Alberta as well. And that's, uh, that's a good thing, but in discussions in the mid 2010s, I, I know Cybera actually took some direct action trying to see if there were ways to get these companies like Transalta or Atco Electric to be involved in possibly doing fiber optic distribution or backhaul services. And it got really complicated. Uh, the electricity regulators get into the game because it was the electricity customers who paid for those uh, optical wires and everything else to go up in the infrastructure and it became very difficult to make those solutions easy the companies weren't going to be able to really make a lot of money off of this and therefore as a sort of a secondary business option it uh, became more complicated than it was worth to them at least that's uh, sort of the indications i've gotten as to how discussions went around that government regulators could change the rules, maybe. So there might be something there. The, the question then comes whether that or for the pipelines, whether it's uh, whether it's worth it, whether that fiber is, is highly necessary or needed, or whether we can go to other solutions that are less complicated. Petroleum companies, same thing, of course, managing their pumps and sensors and such on their pipelines required a good, very robust network solution. Railway fiber was another option for a period of time. I don't know if how many of you would remember a company back in the day called Leadcore. Their, their name changed a couple of times, but they thought that right, railway right-of-ways are, are very uh, solid and secure. The railway owns the right-of-way all the way down the path of the, of the railway itself. And it was actually the Leadcore found a very easy way to be able to lay fiber um, conduit and, and fiber down these uh, railways. And, I, and they put in a line of fiber optic cable that went right from Alberta all the way to Toronto on a CN line, I believe it was. And then they, every number of kilometers, they would take the NACO trailer with uh, six or eight closets built into it and throw it out there. And then different service providers could come in and get access and get back all that way. But for whatever reason, it, uh, it sounded like a great idea, but I don't think it specifically took off in a, in a big direction. So uh, those were other provider options for fiber optics and something for consideration, but we're gonna move on and take a look at the, the next solutions. Wireless internet service providers, fixed wireless solutions. This is with the towers being distributing out uh, via direct uh, line of sight solutions there to the customers. Numerous options available in Alberta. I used that unreliable mapping group of CRTC and uh, ISED uh, from their internet service availability map to determine what providers were in Alberta that were actually doing wireless services. And uh, I got a, a pretty accurate list of at least 21 separate companies across the province. It includes the large ones like ExploreNet, MCSNet, or larger, if you will. and uh, then there used to be uh, CCI, which is now part of ExploreNet, and uh, there's a, a lot of more local providers, some of which may be listening in on today's session, and uh, they're doing a very good job. But um, again, it, it comes down to whether they're able to, to get access to the amount of bandwidth they need for backhaul and uh, whether their radio systems are being upgraded enough to give the types of solutions that we need to meet today's bandwidth needs. And so they, they might, there's definitely should be considered as options for, for people. Certainly they lower the cost, but they potentially uh, need to be upgraded more frequently or something. So pros and cons around wireless internet service providers, but definitely you have a wide variety to choose from in this province. Custom solutions can also be used in the wireless space. And the, one of the best uh, examples of that was Parkland County. Parkland County did create an open access network using towers and they put up uh, well, close to 20 towers, I think, uh, throughout uh, their, if you're not aware of who they are, they're, they're west of Edmonton. And uh, I think they incorporate around Spruce Grove, Stony Plain and uh, going down Highway 16 in that direction on, a, on either side of the highway a little bit. And what they did is they put up these towers. At one point in time, they were also using SuperNet as a backhaul for that service, but 
I'm not sure if that's still the case or not. They have uh, microwaves being I used. I wanted to switch the agenda a few meetings from the morning to the afternoon for next week. Oops. <laughs> well, that was fun. Anyways, we will move on. And uh, so uh, at this point in time, uh, they've got microwave backhaul from, from their more outlying towers back to the more central towers, which then have fiber connectivity. Although I believe the, the county at this time is working very seriously at uh, getting fiber to every one of their towers and uh, improving throughput and capability that way. And we talked yesterday about uh, VNet and Vermilion and how well that's going. It's sort of a hybrid solution, some fiber with uh, uh, with their uh, wireless last mile and uh, of course Viking as well and there are several other options in the province that are, are also moved and have moved in that direction so uh, fixed wireless is, is definitely something to consider as a solution to meet your needs. Last we look at satellites and uh, this is the interesting one and uh, we look at legacy, and these were geostationary uh, Earth orbit satellites, uh, geostationary orbits, and these satellites are parked 42,000 kilometers out into orbit, and it sounds impressive, but the big thing is it actually improve, it gives you quite the latency on your uh, service. Not a big deal if you're if you're streaming one way streaming. Not a big deal if you're moving large volumes of data over whatever level of service you're able to get from this uh, for this particular service provider. Uh, more of an issue around direct communications, two way video and uh, and or audio type services and so on. And so right now Bell is out there, but I think they're just delivering television services. I don't think they actually have data services at this point in time. We have ExploreNet for sure, and also another company called Galaxy Broadband that is also offering satellite internet services in Alberta. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, deployment's pretty easy. Well, it's pretty hard, but it's hard for them, easy for us, because it's already up there. All we have to do is access it. Uh, the question is, uh, if you can create your own networks on it if you're a municipality or whatever, but certainly to provide uh, home internet solutions or services, it's, uh, it's a definitely a good option. Uh, I know that I talked to one provider and uh, they did mention that they planned on competing with their geostationary satellite services with the new low earth orbit satellites. I'm like, what are you going to do now that Elon's got his network out there? And they were basically, we're going to compete. Uh, their idea is, is that their uh, one-time cost for putting in a, a dish or a or an antenna of some sort or whatever will be ending up being less than the 800 bucks you're paying right now for Starlink and that their monthly costs will also be less. And so they're basically saying if latency is not your issue, then they may be able to be competitive still. And they, they have newer satellite solutions that might be deployed in the next year or two that will make them competitive on the bandwidth front. I think there's probably some people that would debate that, uh, but it is what it is, and we'll see where it goes over the next couple of years. Right now, low Earth orbit satellites are the big thing, and the idea is is they're they're only a thousand or fifteen hundred or kilometers or a couple thousand. Well, they vary, uh, but much 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 closer, ten times closer or more, ten or twenty times closer than what the geostationary satellites are. So latency becomes much less of an issue, and you now have the ability to have really good throughput with a a constellation of satellites, as they call them out there. And services have begun. Starlink services are now available in, in uh, parts of Alberta for sure. And it's, uh, it's starting to filter through. A little pricey, 130 bucks a month, but you are or 120, 130 up there. Uh, but you are getting uh, reasonably good through, well, very good throughput. Uh, your download speeds are in excess of 100 megabits per second in a lot of cases. Uh, I know that other than Starlink, Telesat Canada, who we're going to be hearing from this afternoon, is uh, also working on their own constellation as well. It's uh, something that could be up within a couple of years and uh, functioning. And they're going to do, I think they're using a slightly different orbit pattern as well. They might be doing some uh, some polar orbit type solutions that will allow it to get to far northern Canadians as well as uh, 
as to the rest of the world. And so we'll see what type of solutions they have. We know Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos has been working on his own solution uh, to put out thousands of constellations to directly compete with Starlink. Uh, there's one web who was one of the pioneers in this space who ran into some financial difficulty, but the British government has bailed them out. So and there's going to be competition in this space. And then the question is going to be how uh, reasonable, reliable, and so this service is. And it's, it's a bit of wait and see, but there's no question that some spaces in Alberta, some of the, definitely some of the remote spaces in particular, could probably very easily use this as their best cost solution. Time will tell how, how much that goes and, and, uh, and how long, what happens in the long run. So it's a little bit to be determined just yet. So future opportunities. Um, I guess I, I should get going so we can get to questions here, but Universal Broadband Fund, uh, I, I had it at 1.75, it's 1.7 and 1.75 billion altogether. Submissions are closed for now. They put in their rapid deployment uh, response, uh, responses came in and then they had their second call that went out that closed on March 15th. We know over 6 million so far has gone to Alberta projects, 5.4 million to tell us oh, for 47 communities already at this point in time. And they said on their website that future submissions were possible. Uh, I don't believe at this point in time they've deployed anywhere near that $1.7 billion. Uh, and so it's entirely possible that there will still be further calls for universal broadband funding. Well, give them a little bit of time to settle down and see what's going on. But I think in this year still, we'll see that there'll be additional access. The CRTC broadband fund, 750 million. These are not tax dollars, by the way, the CRTC one is. Um, it's actually comes from fees that the CRTC charges to the telcos that the telcos have to pay. And, uh, the, and the fund is designed for, for things like improving services where they need to be improved. Uh, they have a total of five submissions possible. They're, they're gonna re review everything after year three, which is next year. They've had two rounds of submissions so far and only 156.5 million of this total dollars has been allocated so far. So there will be something to, uh, still coming and, and things you can look at submitting towards. No allocations for projects in Alberta to date after the first two calls. Investing in Canada infrastructure program. It's a huge program, 33 billion, but most of it is going to light rail transit projects and major highway upgrades and bridges and that sort of thing. But there is one of the streams there called the Rural and Northern Communities Infrastructure Stream. And that particular stream allows broadband projects to be included. So sort of focused on rural and northern, but uh, definitely uh, something Albertans could look at. But the federal and provincial governments negotiate a certain amount of funds going in, into each stream over this 10-year project, 10-year uh, lifetime of this uh, particular fund. And there's 159 million allocated over 10 years to 2028. But you're gonna be competing for that money because some of that money will be going to increasing water um, through you know, getting clean water or going to better sewage or improved roadways. So you're, you're competing against other projects for rural and northern communities. But broadband, if it becomes a priority and is a priority in the community, these funds can be allocated towards that. So those are some of the options. Provincial broadband strategy. I, I told Holly that uh, I was going to invite her over to my place for coffee this morning so she could talk about it, but uh, she said no, um, unfortunately. But what can you do? Uh, the, the strategy has been announced as something the province is working on. There's thrown speech in 2020 and 2021 has announced this uh, even back when I was still a part of that uh, world of Supernet, uh, we had started looking at a provincial broadband strategy that we, we needed to be working on and, and putting out. We had to have the second thing. I think the second Supernet contract has actually helped initiate that, that provincial broadband strategy. Uh, something in that section 13 about rural development that uh, you may or may not be aware of is that Bell also, there's a, a percentage of the uh, fees they that they charge for Supernet that are actually going into a fund. And that fund is to enhance rural development of broadband. So 
there's uh, there's different things that are, are happening. It's an undisclosed amount. I couldn't see it in my redacted version of the contract. So, uh, but in, in any case, it's it's definitely something that's uh, going to be happening. I know that there's been serious work. I've I've uh, uh, had a chance to talk to uh, some of my old cohorts uh, from time to time, and uh, and uh, while they can't say anything without shooting me, uh, they uh, they definitely have uh, been working on this. So there will be something company uh, coming. As I said earlier, don't let your strategies be waiting for their strategies. If you have to proceed, you have to proceed. And I've been telling people that in government all the time. Alberta coordinated leadership for the development of rural broadband solutions. Well, we have a we have a kind of a solution, the ARCC, right? Isn't that what this is all about? Uh, the idea is to coordinate. One of the biggest problems we have with funding right now is it's all piecemeal. The federal government manages telecommunications across the province, but some of the biggest winners, education, health, uh, and some of the other societal needs and such within the provinces are, are provincially managed in scope. So it's really tough for the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development to score a big win where he can show I saved this much money by putting broadband out there uh, because it doesn't fall into his, uh, his, his basket. Is that, a, is that a concern? I don't know. They're, they're throwing the money out there and it's big money now. But the problem is, are they really uh, able to achieve what's needed to be done with projects that are, may or may not be sustainable if they're being handled at uh, such a small level? coordinating it, having things that we can do that are um, going to be cookie cutter solutions and that sort of thing. And that's why we need these conferences, these forums. We have to be able to, to see what's going on and see if we can do this and in a coordinated manner would be nice. So that's, uh, that's where things are going. And uh, at, at this point in time, I am done. So uh, ready for questions, Mr. Moderator. Excellent. So, uh, Erwin, thank you so much for, for your presentation here. Um, right now, um, one of the things that I, I kind of sort of jumped out at me in early in your presentation was talking about the uh, challenges that are faced with some of the data skews that are there. Um, like, you know, we've, in, in some conversations we've had, we usually hear about um, when the government's assessing things, they're, they're looking at the data in a geographical region, but they're not taking into account like an oil field site or a military base. Um, so what is the best way when you're trying to submit a proposal to, to try to rectify that and to sort of myth bust what's going on there? I, I believe in discussions I had with, uh, with CIRA actually uh, about their data, there are mechanisms in which you can... Um, uh, what's what's the right appeal the grant funding decisions uh, of the federal government but you have to show that uh, you have data that is different from their data so you actually have to, to be able to show them that information right now working with CIRA I mean uh, it's like uh, Rob showed at Sturgeon County Sturgeon County did actually get information directly from CIRA it may come at a cost it won't be a huge cost because they are a nonprofit, but they uh, they have to try to recoup some of their costs as well but you can uh, have a discussion with them about getting access to their data and actually seeing what uh what your what your community is actually achieving as far as throughput goes and if you can then show in some cases you have to actually give um, street addresses and uh, and or legal land descriptions to um, to the CRTC or to basically to the Canadian uh, government you have to then show them that these particular areas are achieving these test results and uh, it might be a bit tedious but hey, money is money. If, if there's a way for you to minimize your cost to get that info, that might be the right answer. So, uh, if people have any questions, throw them in the chat in the bottom there. Uh, I know Craig kind of commented here that uh, Sierra subscription is $3,000 uh, in relation to data. Um, I know some Sierra people actually were on the, the call yesterday, so maybe they'll they'll be able to answer that later later in the sort of the center feed. Um, what do you do when you're, and I've, I, we've heard this technique or challenge being an issue before, but what do you do if your, uh, your internet's so slow you can't run the connectivity test? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's where you take out your mobile phone. No, um, 
That's uh, that is a concern. Um, actually, that's a that's a good question to ask, Sarah. Uh, I I think the biggest problem is I th they if they they have had I think they might have a simplified version of their. Uh, I think you can click for a simplified version of their web page as well that can actually uh, help to reduce throughput uh, as well to make it easier. So that might be something to take a peek at. So, but yeah, there's no real good answer other than. It's pretty bad at that point, but yeah, you definitely want to try though. And and one of the things Sarah made me do, I, I used to. Uh, there's a there's a place out near Canmore where my wife and I would go on occasion, and uh, they had internet services there, but they were pretty poor. And we were trying to show the the owner of the facility that you know it's pretty poor. And I used the internet performance test, but I never filled out all the little detailed parts, and I got sort of reprimanded by Sarah for that. When you're doing those internet performance tests, fill out the information there because they capture that information and it then becomes something that your community might be able to use uh, you know, as necessary. So if you're going to do the test, fill it all out as much as you can. Excellent. Uh, James asks a good question. Is there any strategic capacity within our current provincial government? And then he kind of puts a sub comment there, a serious question. <laughs> Um, strategic capacity within our uh, provincial government uh, is that like capacity to be able to deal with the telecommunications as a as a service or internet as a service? If that's what the question is, yes, uh, Service Alberta has a team uh, pretty much dedicated to the Supernet project at this point in time. But definitely, there's uh, there's been some people that I know were hired on right around the time I was retiring to to look at. Um, policies, I know policies sounds like, well, that's not really an answer, but policies are what governments work on, uh, but they are looking at how to implement policies that will become part of a strategic, uh, provincial strategic plan around broadband. So um, there is capacity within the government. Is it sufficient? Hard to say. Fair enough. Um, and so uh, as we're kind of rolling into uh, 1201, uh, just kind of a final question here. Um, what are the uh, what are the hurdles to using the site for a kickoff point? So speaking in relation to like schools and and the supernet. So um, you know, there's is there a possibility to have a discussion about using the schools as sort of that kickoff point to to bring real connectivity? Um, kind of tying into that or, or coming up with some MOU or a deal for a smaller community potentially. Okay, yeah, and 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 uh, I know there's a couple of school division IT directors on this uh, session right now that I used to interact with a lot, and uh, every one of them I think asked me that question at one point in time because the whole idea was their their kids can get internet in the school but they can't when they get outside and we heard that on the uh, the First Nations panel yesterday as well that uh, it's great if they can get it in the high school but what about when they're stuck in their uh, in their home because of COVID. Uh, now what? And, uh, and and these guys wanted to use their school sites to be able to then, uh, as a hotspot, if you will, to distribute wireless solutions out to the homes. Uh, there were contractual issues with that. Um, it's a, it becomes a matter of whether you're doing this as a nonprofit municipal project or a for-profit by having a third party uh, coming in to do that distribution and sell those services. And that's the part where it gets tricky because uh, first of all, the, the, the bandwidth to the schools is subsidized by the Alberta government. There's, uh, there's money paid by Alberta Ed and, uh, and so on. So it, be, it becomes tricky that way. And, and also Supernet's not supposed to be competing with other local providers. And I know the argument was there are no other providers, so we're not competing with anybody. Uh, and so on, but it's complicated. But the reality is uh, that the new service allows the new contract that section 13 for you got muted, Urban. There you go. I think you're back on, Erwin. Sorry. I think somebody was muting me like, hey, you're done. It's 12 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, the bottom line was it became complicated because of those types of reasons uh, and, and so on. But now there's access 
to the handhole that might be right outside that school to put your own fiber in and buy your own commercial service off a of supernet if you want to have somebody redeploying it. So I think the opportunities are there now under the new contract in ways that they weren't in the first one. Excellent. And and to close us and and you know I'm I'm going to ask you to kind of look into your crystal ball for a moment here. Um, but given that um, you've had a lot of experience within government and, and um, through different administrations, and, and we do know that there is a um, broadband strategy that's forthcoming, if you could look into that crystal ball, um, what do you think is going to come out of this, this strategy? Is, is, there, is there anything that, that you think might come as a surprise, or would it be pretty straightforward? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a <laughs> good question. I, I, I don't know that I can give you anything really definitive because it would be pure speculation on my part at this point in time. Uh, the government has changed since I retired. The uh, situation with COVID and everything else is putting pressures on government that haven't existed at the time I was uh, still involved in this. So I, I think that uh, it could be very speculative to think that there's going to be any sort of large funding initiative that the government would throw into it right away. Uh, I, it may be more around helping to look for a coordinated response, particularly for federal funding. So if there, you know, maybe the reason the Universal Broadband Fund got cut off, for example, might be that the government, the Canadian government has been negotiating with provincial governments to uh, come up with uh, coordinated, that's the old, uh, you know, the, the Canadian government, we used to call it, uh, we still, still do, I think, 50 cent dollars, right? You know, because the, they're putting in funding, but only if you put in funding. Well, if the province is able to assist with the localized funding for these types of projects, then that might be part of what the provincial strategy is. Yeah, and I guess it's yet to be seen because we've just seen announcements coming out of Quebec in, in that vein too. Yes, that's exactly right. So. Uh, that's the best answer I could give you right now. I, it's uh, it's going to be a surprise for all of us, I think, when we finally get the right answer. But I'm going to think it's going to be around coordinating efforts and uh, uh, larger access to um, shared grant funding solutions. 